Okay. Welcome, all of you. Uh, very good afternoon to the colleagues uh, from India. Maybe there are people from Europe. So good morning to you. Uh, it's really my pleasure uh, to, uh, invite, uh, to welcome uh, all of you to this uh, uh, webinar. Um, this would be the 40th webinar um, in our webinar series of uh, spin uh, really a pleasure that <clears throat> we could manage, uh, you know, uh, with your cooperation for about 40 weeks, uh, so which is roughly uh, close to 10 months or so. And uh, I am uh, very happy today that I'm going to invite uh, Professor Sobhi Chatterjee from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research uh, as the speaker of today. And uh, uh, is uh, basically working as a leader at uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, he joined last year um, as a new faculty new young colleague, where he's setting up a quantum materials uh, laboratory. His uh, current research interests involve epitaxial growth and electron spectroscopy of intermetallic systems and their possible application areas, primarily focusing on topological phenomena, quantum phase He has obtained a PhD in physics from Cornell University in 2017, working with Professor Kyle Sen and Darren, Darren Slow, and a bachelor degree from IIT Khadakpur in 2018. His thesis was on angle of photoemission and strongly correlated systems such as uh, um, URU2, SI2, and uh, YBL3. Following his PhD, he went to UC San. Santa Barbara, where he worked with Professor Chris Palstro on Hoistler and rare earth mon uh, monopinticide thin films. He has received the ABS Electronics and Photonics Division Postdoctoral Award in 2017 and Jesse Goes Gold Medal from I in 2010. Uh, with this uh, brief introduction, so again, uh, I, I very happily welcome uh, Sobik uh, for this seminar. He has been very wonderful participant throughout the whole series asking very interesting questions. Uh, so today we are very much looking forward to a lecture. And uh, there may be some new participants just to tell you that during the lecture, we don't take questions usually. So kindly write your questions or write a high message and at the end, uh, I will uh, take all the questions from you and we'll discuss. So with this, so we, it's all yours. Thank you so much again. Uh, thank you, Shivankar. It's, uh... It's really a great pleasure uh, to be able to give a talk uh, on some of our work. And I also want to take this opportunity to you know, thank the organizers for organizing such a splendid seminar. And uh, it was uh, really uh, great for me also to attend uh, a lot of talks that was uh, in the previous, uh, previous talks. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, so we are primarily uh, a quantum materials group where we uh, focus on uh, material systems, uh, uh, particularly intermetallic systems, where we are interested uh, in topological phenomena, uh, quantum phase transitions, and also strongly correlated electron systems. Uh, We're not necessarily a spintronics focus group, but uh, hopefully uh, today uh, we can, I can convince you that, uh, you know, this strongly correlated systems can also be interesting uh, in the application areas of spintronics and might be of interest uh, to many of you who are members of this community. Okay, uh, so just to start with a broad background, uh, why we are really interested in this quantum materials, and the answer really is that uh, these compounds uh, can uh, realize in many of exotic ground states, uh, for example, superconductivity, um, heavy fermion behavior, where the electron effective mass can be as high as 100 to 1000 times more than that of uh, conventional metals. And I'll tell a, a lot about these material systems in a later part of the talk. Uh, topological materials, and uh, I'm sure every one of you are now very familiar with this, which uh, uh, brought in a revolution in our understanding of classification of matter in condensed matter systems. Uh, to electron fractionalization in, you know, in fractional quantum Hall effect, to spin charge separation, different kinds of quantum spin liquids, and so on and so forth. But perhaps in the last two or three decades, it is becoming uh, equally important or you know, people are getting equally excited, not only about realizing all these uh, exotic properties which are of interest in their own right, 
but also in seeing whether we can actually try to control all these exotic phenomena in an effort to utilize them in some uh, sort of functional devices. And one way uh, to realize these sorts of goals is what I say called by uh, creating, you know, what I call a designer quantum materials. But the idea basically is that you can start with some of the functional building blocks that you might be interested in. For our case, it's mostly the intermetallic systems. And then if you have access to a synthesis tool, which, you will, uh, which will allow you to create these materials in a bottoms up manner, then you can start thinking about, uh, you know, uh, utilizing some of these tuning parameters, for example, this electrostatic gating, proximity effect, and uh, some sort of biaxial strain to try to now tune uh, these material properties uh, so, as, so as to you know, control this kind of uh, the properties that you're interested in in a very controlled manner. And furthermore, if you have access to spectroscopy, then we can now uh, also get a direct understanding of some of the microscopic mechanisms at play uh, in these material systems, and thereby, uh, you know, closing uh, the so-called phase, uh, phase uh, the feedback loop, where uh, the idea again is that uh, after a few such iterations, one might be able to create materials uh, which are uh, exactly ta tailored to give the right kind of properties. And in the process, you might also uh, get some sort of an emergent uh, phases of matter. And now because uh, we are in a, uh, we are creating this materials in a bottoms up manner, uh, they are very amenable to, you know, thin film geometries and also to devices. So one can think about utilizing some of these properties readily in many different applications, you know, varying from uh, spintronics to thermoelectrics and even to quantum computing. Now, just to give you a brief, uh, hello, yeah, is it, okay. Um, so just to give you a brief uh, flavor of uh, how, uh, you know, so with some of these examples of how these uh, approach actually work in practice, uh, I'll just quickly go over some of our recent work where here we are uh, looking at, the, at an interface uh, between our rock salt and a zinc blend structure, which is here is gallium antimonide and the lutetium antimonide. And what we find is that because of this bonding mismatch, there are these kind of sort of buckling at the interface of this lutetium atom where you have to see this change in the bond angle. And that actually uh, causes a charge transfer and stabilizes a two dimensional hole gas uh, in the interface. And furthermore, um, you can also show that in these sort of, uh, you know, heterostructure of lutetium antimony and gallium antimonide, uh, so lutetium antimony, here you have the equal concentration of uh, electron, uh, electron-like and the hole-like carriers. But when you start thinning it down, you basically get away from this compensated regime to a non-compensated regime, uh, both due to the different effect of the quantization on the hole-like and electron-like carriers, and also due to the charge transfer at the interface. So th this work should be coming out uh, next week in Science Advances, but we also have this on archive uh, if you're interested. And the second, another work that uh, we have been uh, working on very recently is that now this is a, another kind of intermetallic system, which is a hoister compound of platinum, gold, uh, lutetium, antimony, uh, where uh, we could show that uh, we can, just by using substitution alloying, we can actually change the position of the surface chemical potential vis-a-vis -vis the topological surface states that you see as you go increasing gold, the surface chemical potential can be shifted up. And also uh, we can actually enhance the localization of the bulk states and thereby control the coupling between the surface states and the bulk and giving rise to a very dramatic change in the magneto resistance behavior. But you can see in the low gold sample right here, you have a very linear magneto resistance, which is also have been seen in many other topological systems. But just by playing with the amount of doping in this material system and just by enhancing the localization of the bulk state, thereby reducing the interaction between the bulk and the surface, we can actually get from this linear magneto resistance regime to a regime where we can see the onset of the quantum Hall phase, which again arises from the topological surface states. Okay, so, but today uh, I will not be talking about either of these systems, but I'll tell you about another of these intermetallic systems, which are the heavy fermionic systems. 
and I'll show that how these materials might actually be important uh, for the application area of spintronics and where we can actually make use of the strong correlations that are present uh, in these heavy fermionic systems into something useful, in, uh, and that is the generation of the giant uh, spin orbit torque. And that's basically the uh, main uh, title of the talk as well. All right, so, you know, um, of course, in, in this uh, community, uh, to this audience, it's probably needs no introduction, but uh, just uh, so that uh, we all are on the same page. Um, so basically, you know, the, the, the idea of spintronics has been around now for uh, quite a few years, and it has been uh, attracting a lot of attention because, um, uh, you know, with this, uh, if one can make a really useful spintronic device, then it has a lot of applications, particularly in terms of energy efficiency and also like uh, waste heat management. So it has all these nice, nice benefits. But uh, on the left, what, we, what I'm showing you here is kind of a view graph from Intel where um, they were showing that, you know, like uh, over the years, it has become more and more apparent that to really make uh, these sort of interesting uh, phenomena uh, encompassing spintronics uh, into a viable technology, what we really need are actually new sorts of materials, okay, which have, uh, you know, better properties and which can really make uh, some sort of a viable device. And uh, one minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so the one area where uh, this uh, idea of spintronics uh, is very close to actual commercialization is this idea of this uh, spin transfer torque uh, magnetic random access memory, uh, where basically the idea is that uh, you are uh, passing a current through this trilayer junction where you have an initial ferromagnet and a spacer layer and then and another ferromagnet. And what is happening here is that when you pass this current, this current getting spin polarized, and then that spin polarized current can get absorbed uh, into the next layer. And then when it gets absorbed, there's a transfer of the angular momentum. And by then it can provide a finite torque to the magnetization vector and thereby flipping it. So instead of utilizing a uh, magnetic field, we can use a charge current to actually bring about uh, flipping of the magnetic vector of the free magnetization vector of the free layer and utilizing these sort of uh, tunnel barrier devices, uh, we can actually have a very different resistance based on whether this the magnetic moments are aligned or anti-aligned and thereby that that can use uh, that can be used as you know units of memory like bits zero and one. And this has uh, many uh, many advantages. For example, it can be non-volatile, it can be fairly fast, it can be dense, and there are also many, uh, you know, there are no moving parts. Uh, the fabrication is generally easier and it's also relatively easier to scale things up. But perhaps you can immediately recognize there is a little issue in the sense that what we are doing here is that we are actually uh, passing current to uh, exert some finite amount of torque on the magnetization vector, which is a macroscopic uh, vector. And uh, so basically what we need is a huge amount of current to actually have a finite amount of torque, which can switch this macros macroscopic quantity. So, uh, but the problem here is that because this is, uh, there is a spacer layer through which the current needs to go through, um, you know, like we have to really work very hard to push a large amount of current. And many a times what happens is that this can actually destroy your device because these spatial, spatial layers are, you know, of the, of the order of tens of nanometers. So, but anyways, I mean, there is uh, still, it's already, it is a viable technology and you can actually uh, get this kind of spin torque MRAM out there in the market. Uh, so this is just one uh, picture of one such device. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are other ways of actually people quickly re realize that there are other ways of actually uh, bringing about the same uh, effect and which is the idea is that of the spin orbit torque and where uh, instead of the spin transfer torque that I just uh, told you in the last slide. Um, so here what is happening is that um, we have an additional layer, which is that in, in this case, it is often heavy metal. And we are passing a current through this heavy metal, which is actually generating a spin current in the transverse direction. And then that is getting absorbed and providing a finite torque on the magnetization vector and thereby flipping it. So it's basically almost the same, but the major difference 
here is that the current is not being passed to the entire entirety of the device and that makes a huge difference also because the heavy uh, that's one and the second is also because this heavy metals are generally you know they're metals so the resistivity is not very high so even though you would uh, even though if you if you have to pass a large amount of current you can do it uh, fairly easily without destroying the device and you can also do so this is the what is called the spin hall effect so you can also do this uh, similar thing uh, by utilizing what is known as the rashba edelstein effect or the inverse spin galvanic effect where you know you can uh, create um, uh, non equilibrium spin polarization at the interface between uh, you know a rashba surface let's say between a heavy metal uh, uh, and and your uh, magnet or and your ferromagnet and then you can generate a uh, spin current which can then gets absorbed in, this, in a similar manner in the ferromagnet and can provide a torque thereby switching uh, the magnetization vector. So uh, let me tell you, uh, just expand on the spin hall effect a little bit more. So where, as I mentioned that uh, this the spin hall effect is basically nothing but a transverse generation of spin current in response to the propagation of a charge current in this direction. And this can have a uh, few different origins and broadly you can divide it into two different camps. One is the extrinsic effect and another is the intrinsic one. So for the extrinsic effect, it's probably a little easier to understand. You can think about the electrons which are moving in your material system and you have some uh, impurity which has a strong spin orbit coupling and then the electrons can suffer uh, some spin dependent scattering and that can generate uh, this kind of a transfer spin current. But it can also occur, you know, in an intrinsic manner where, you know, if your material is already very spin orbit coupled, a heavy, uh, heavy metal, for example, then the electron while moving through this material system uh, can actually feel the effect of an effective field and thereby create this uh, transverse spin current. And it turns out that this actually, um, the, the, the materials berry phase actually plays a big role. So the electronic structure of the material system um, can have an effect on the on the strength of the spin current that you can generate in your material system and so here uh, we will actually look uh, more um, you know expand on this idea of this correlation uh, between the electronic structure and the spin hall effect um, that uh, one can gen one can generate in any material system and that in a way would be uh, would be the meat of this talk today um, so just to take this uh, you know this idea a little bit forward so in a, in a very naive terms, uh, if we want to enhance this, uh, you know, spin hall effect, one way might be to increase uh, the spin orbit effect and that, you know, you might be, uh, you might want to increase the L dot S term, right, near the chemical potential. So naturally, uh, one might be persuaded to look at the bottom half of the periodic table because there you can actually have a uh, large orbital angular momentum, spin momentum. And so maybe you can, uh, one can expect that you can get a large spin hall conductivity as well. So naturally people have been looking um, and, and the lanthanide series, uh, you know, this is just a portion of the lanthanide series where all of them has have uh, uh, partially filled F shells. And uh, so, this is uh, what I'm showing you he uh, here is basically some calculations uh, from the density functional theory where you can estimate what would be your spin hall conductivity in your material system. And so on the y axis, you have the spin hall conductivity. And on the x axis, what I'm plotting here is this on site correlation U. So this is nothing uh, but a way to um, incorporate the strong correlation effect that the F orbitals feel because you know the F orbitals, uh, they are, uh, the overlap between the two adjacent F orbitals is very small. They are, uh, uh, they are not very as expanded as other the D or SP orbitals. So one way to, uh, so th that's why they have a high uh, on-site Coulomb repulsion. And so one way to take that into account in your uh, calculations in the density functional theory is to add this kind of an ad hoc parameter, which is the on-site Coulomb repulsion U. And what I'm showing here is that if you uh, look at, for example, a homium or dysprosium, when I increase this parameter U, what is happening is your spin hall conductivity is going down. And what is happening actually in your band structure is that when you add this on-site correlations, the contribution of the F orbitals in the valence band actually getting more and more diminished. So these, the F levels are going more and more 
below uh, higher in binding energy or below the Fermi level. And that is also reflected in the, you know, in the spin hole conductivity being down or going down as you go up in it. And you can also see that, okay, in lutetium, because it has a complete F shell. So, you know, these are, these F shells are very inert. So you won't expect uh, any uh, much contribution from the F orbital anyways. So there is not much effect when you increase the U or downside correlation. So, okay. So then, um, you know, still uh, uh, one can go ahead and uh, measure uh, the spin hole conductivity for this um, many different uh, rare earth elements. And that was done here, as I'm showing you, this is the experimental data, and this is the spin hole conductivity that was expected uh, from the density functional theory calculations. And what you can readily see is that uh, the numbers here, you know, are not very encouraging. They're very modest. And one reason uh, to understand this is that even though um, you would expect that, uh, you know, because this has the unfilled F shell, uh, you might uh, have very large uh, spin hole conductivity in these materials, but because of this on-site Coulomb repulsion, and if you look at the band structure, there is actually very small um, contribution of the F orbitals in the bands close to the Fermi energy, or that closes uh, that crosses the Fermi energy. That is where uh, most of the effect is coming from. So now, then naturally, the question uh, that maybe comes to your mind is that okay, so if that is the case, a can we enhance the F electron density of states at the Fermi level? And B, it would be even better if we can have an external tuning parameter, which will allow us to actually tune this F electron density of states. Because, you know, as I just mentioned before that uh, the spin hole conductivity can have many different origins. So even if you see a large effect, how do you uh, really tell that where is this coming from? And the one way might be to, you know, have some handle or, or, you know, on the some physical parameter which you think is responsible. And if you see a similar effect in a spin hole conductivity as well, then you can maybe correlate the two and make a very uh, strong statement about uh, the origin of the spin hole conductivity in a particular material system. And the last point that I want to mention here is about the electronic correlations. So if you look at the literature, at least uh, in the current literature, apart from this our work, which I'm going to tell you today, so you can, uh, I think we can broadly classify uh, the, the, you know, the materials that have been studied for, uh, you know, this large spin hole conductivities into three different categories. Uh, one is the heavy metals, you know, for platinum is a great example. Then there are also these uh, Rajba interfaces where you have, um, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, non-equilibrium spin, uh, spin population at the, at the interfaces. And also similar to this uh, Rajba interfaces, uh, you, you can also get, uh, you know, topological surface states where uh, the spin momentum, there's a very strong spin momentum locking. So naturally, uh, there was expectation um, that, you know, this, uh, if one can utilize, one might be able to utilize this topological surface states to generate a strong um, spin hole conductivity, which was indeed the case. But one common feature, uh, you know, which unites all these three classes of material systems is that they can all be very well described by the traditional band structure approaches. So there is no uh, reason for, uh, you know, for someone to add, uh, uh, invoke ideas from strong correlation physics in these material systems. So then the question is, you know, can electron correlations uh, have, play a role in, the, in enhancing the spin hole effect in any material system? So with these three, um, you know, questions, broad questions in mind, I would uh, change gears here a little bit and tell you about a completely different system, um, uh, you know, which is that of a mixed field and contour lattice system. And hopefully at the, by the end of the talk, I'll, uh, I'll uh, convince you that this material system uh, can actually be a very good generator of the spin out talk. Okay, so um, this is, uh, 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 you know, a binary uh, intermetallic system with a very simple crystal structure, which is uh, cubic, as you see in here. Uh, uh, so where you have the tubium atoms here and the aluminum atoms at the face centers. Um, so one interest in these uh, material systems, so these are a class of a very broad, uh, um, this is a particular example of a very broad class of material system, which are known as the condor lattice system. And one, uh, important, uh, one excitement about this compound was that uh, 
it's mixed valent nature. And what, what I mean by that is that uh, if you look at the ethiopium valence, okay, so you have ethiopium here, and if you look at the local ethiopium valence as a function of temperature, you will find that that valence is actually A, uh, is uh, not an integer, it's a fraction, it's between two and three. And moreover, it actually changes as a function of temperature. So there must be something that is going on uh, that drives this uh, change in the local valence of this ethereum atoms. And to understand that, um, and I have alluded to what actually is going on by this name, this condo lattice. So let me just take a step back and tell you a little bit about the condo effect, which I'm sure every one of you is very familiar with. Uh, so this is basically uh, the physics, you know, of uh, very trace amount of local moments in a metallic host. And uh, the, so as, as I've shown you here, you have this local moment, and this is being surrounded by this conduction electrons. And what it does is that it forms a local singlet right in here. And the telltale signature of uh, these sort of an effect was actually um, discovered experimentally long way back, you know, in 1936, when it was found that you know, in a resistivity of a metal, you have this sharp upturn as you go down in temperature. And this is very counterintuitive, at least uh, to the then, uh, either to the knowledge of you know, the electron phonon scattering, as where you actually expect that you go down in temperature, your scattering magnitude goes down, so your uh, resistivity should keep going down. So later it was found that this was because of there was a trace amount of impurity in this material systems, which acts as local moment. And furthermore, it was found that, uh, you know, this, uh, because of this strong interaction the, uh, uh, between this conduction electrons or more delocalized electrons and this local moment, there is actually spin flip scattering and these local moment sites, which adds a resistivity term, which grows logarithmically as you go down in temperature. Okay. And this is the, this is the well-known condo effect. And later it was found that uh, there is a new energy scale and an universal scaling behavior. Uh, and this new energy scale, one can um, uh, denote that by this condo temperature. Now, instead of having this case where you have this trace amount of magnetic moment, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a lattice, let's, go to the very extreme case on the other end, where you have these local moments, not only in a, uh, you know, in a very randomly distributed uh, and in a very trace amount, but these are actually uh, arranged in a periodic manner in your lattice in your system. And why is this important? It's because this turns out to be very uh, good model to understand the underlying physics of ethereum trilaminite. As I told you, this ethereum, you know, it, it has F14, 6S2. So ethereum 3 plus will have F13. So it's a one F hole. And then this, each of the ethereum atoms can be actually thought to be uh, as a local moment. And then the other conduction electrons, which is screening these local moments comes from the uh, more delocalized aluminum P orbitals. And this actually has a very strong uh, uh, signature in physical properties. For example, if you were to look at the, uh, 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 the magnetic susceptibility, for example, you will find that at high temperature, it shows a Curie-Weiss behavior, which is, you know, indicative of some local moments. But miraculously, as you go down in temperature, this actually crosses over into a Pauli paramagnetism, as if the, the local moments have all disappe disappeared in your material system. And in the, uh, and in, you know, in the momentum space, uh, how you can think about is that at high temperature, which is shown by the dotted lines, you have this very delocalized uh, conduction electrons, which is the green dotted line here, which comes from the SPT orbital, SP or D, depending on what material you're looking at. And you also have this very uh, localized F states, which is not coherent at all. But then when you go down in temperature, because of this condo coupling at each of these lattice sites, what can now happen is that uh, instead of just being the condo effect, these each of this uh, condo effect at this lattice size can actually uh, develop a long range coherence because now you have uh, additional periodicity for the lattice and that can bring down your resistance and create a, a, you know, a many body states and that leads to a hybridization of the F degree of freedom with the conduction electrons giving rise to this very flat bands very close to the Fermi level. And naturally you can see that uh, because of this emergence of this very flat bands, very close to the Fermi level, 
their effective mass of the carriers in this material system shoots up. And one way to see it is to look at the electronic specific heat coefficient of this material system. Uh, you know, if you, uh, within a from liquid theory, if you were to do uh, uh, just the, you know, back of the envelope uh, calculation, the, the numbers that you might uh, pull out is something of the order of one millijoule per mole Kelvin square. And that we know is uh, directly gives you an idea of the effective mass in your system. And if you look at some of the normal materials that you are in, that you might be interacting with in your day to day life, you can see that this number is actually not that uh, different from what you um, estimate, uh, you know, just very simply, you know, from here. But this very number is actually 45, which in ethereum EL3, and it can be as high as 100 to 1000 times more than that of the copper. And it is in this respect that these material systems are also known as heavy fermionic system as in the sense that the effective carriers actually have become very heavy in these material systems. And uh, this has been of interest for you know the last more than last three decades uh, because um, these um, these material systems are very good um, experimental test bed to uh, test the ideas of uh, quantum criticality. Uh, it has also it is also the uh, the first known unconventional superconductivity was also found uh, in these heavy fermion material systems. And also there are uh, um, hints that it might also realize a spin triplet superconductivity. So. Uh, yeah, so there are all these nice properties. That's why many people were interested in this. But what we were interested particularly was um, to understand how this local change in ethereum valence that I just told you um, some slides back actually leads, uh, is actually related, or if it is actually related to the electronic structure or the momentum resolved electronic structure of the material system. And so one way to you know directly answer this question would be to just uh, you know visualize uh, to have a probe which can directly visualize your momentum resolved electronic structure and there is indeed a tool which uh, one can readily use and which is known as the angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy so where uh, this is nothing but you know a twist on the einstein's photoelectric effect where what you are doing is that you are coming in with a monochromatic uh, photon beam like in here and you are kicking out a photon electron uh, and when now, if you can measure uh, both the kinetic energy of the photoelectron and also the angle vis a vis the some well defined uh, crystallographic axis of your sample surface um, by, util by using this, uh, you know, this, um, uh, this uh, steel object, uh, which is known as the photo detector, one can then. Uh, from this measured quantity, apply the simple rules of energy and momentum conservation and get back the desired quantities of binding energy and the momentum of this electron when it was inside the solid. Now, if you do this for many different angles, you can then relate it to the many different momenta. And also, uh, you can also get a, a idea about all the different binding energies. And so if you stitch all of these together, what you can generate is something known as this kind of a, uh, uh, electron map. So what I'm showing you here is how the electrons are um, arranged for a particular slice, uh, a planar slice at the binding energy zero, that is at the Fermi energy uh, um, of the three-dimensional brillion zone. And we can go down to higher binding energy uh, just from the same measurements. And you can see that as I go down in binding energy, you can see how the electrons are actually organized and um, in, in, in different bands. So basically one can get a direct uh, view of the band structure of a material system with this technique. Okay, and uh, this is not just, uh, it's not just that, it also gives you an idea about uh, interactions in your material systems. For example, you know, if, uh, if, if you were to, if, the, if you, if, you know, there were no interaction in your material system and you have kicked out an electron from your materials, then you might expect uh, peaks at very discrete energies, but, you know, in a real materials, there are interactions. So what you see generally is a redistribution of the spectral weight, which captures this interactions in your material system. And because we are talking about a many body uh, system, it is, it makes sense to um, talk about the, you know, the many body means function. And what we actually measure the intensity in a photo emission experiment can be actually directly related 
uh, to the many body greens function for example here this i k omega can uh, is actually um, can be written as a product of a few different terms where you know that uh, m k omega is just the, from the fermi's golden rule this is a matrix element uh, f omega is uh, basically the fermi dirac distribution uh, because we can only take out electrons from the occupied part of the band structure and this quantity it's called this a single particle spectral function a k omega which encodes within it both the imaginary and the real part of the self energy that captures all the effects of the interactions in your material system so just by measuring the intensity uh, the the photo emission intensity as a function of the momentum and the energy one can get a uh, direct uh, estimate of the uh, self energy in your material system and this has been utilized in uh, to understand many different kinds of uh, quantum materials but the catch here is something different. So, you know, the, uh, the problem here is that ARPUS is very surface sensitive. Um, and because we are taking the electrons out uh, uh, and we know that the electrons interact very strongly in a material system. So the mean free path is really short. And so that creates a very stringent requirement on the kind of material system uh, that we can actually probe. Um, so typically how these uh, measurements are done is that you break the crystals apart and expose a pristine sample surface on which you can then do uh, uh, on, on, on which you can do your ARPUS measurement. And these measurements are typically uh, done in a 5, 10 to the power minus 11 tor, which is 13 orders below the atmosphere. But the problem that was here is that uh, because it is a three-dimensional crystal structure in ytterbium AL3, we could not, uh, you know, you could not really break open this uh, sample. So uh, this crystal structure, it didn't have a natural cleavage plane. And even if you wanted to do so, you invariably exposed many different crystallographic phases on which it was very difficult to, you know, uh, do uh, momentum resolved, uh, in, get some momentum resolved information from this uh, material system. So one way to you know, get around this problem is to fabricate your material systems uh, by molecular beam epitaxy, where we are, this is, you can think of as a, you know, uh, just atomic spray painting, where we are coming in with some very well calibrated atomic sources and we are spraying atoms and we are growing these materials in a bottom sub manner, where each of this uh, layer is taking the sh under shape of the underlying crystalline substrate. And uh, this can be, uh, this also can be done in, uh, is done in an ultra high vacuum environment and it can be extremely pure and can be done with very fine, uh, very high perfection. So much so that your mobility in some gallium arsenide two deck can reach more than 35 million centimeters square per full second. So now by combining these two te UHV techniques of uh, MB and ARPUS, we can actually are now not limited into the cleavable materials. We can look at all the bulk material systems and I'll talk about a little bit about YBL3. We can also look at metastable phases and look at strain engineered phases. And also we can look at artificial heterostructures and super lattices. And so by this, all these things, we can have independent control over all these different tuning parameters that I told you earlier and directly visualize how the electronic structure is changing in response uh, to the changes uh, or in response to all these tuning parameters. So um, here, uh, I'm showing you um, the read images. Uh, so these are the electron diffraction images, which you can take while growing this material system. Uh, so we use magnesium oxide to grow this ytterbium trialuminite thin film uh, because it has the right lattice constant. But as many of you might know, it's not, it's a difficult, uh, it's difficult to, um, you know, synthesize an intermetallic system on an oxide substrate. So we had to um, do a few tricks of that of utilizing aluminum and lutetium trialuminite as a buffer layer. And you can see that by the time uh, we have our ytterbium trialuminide, we have a very nice streaky read pattern, which indicates that we have a smooth surface. And we have also good crystallinity in, your, in our material system. And this can be independently uh, verified uh, by X-ray diffraction measurement. We have a single phase, these are epitaxial. And also by just looking at the you know, transport measurement, we can see that below about 37 Kelvin, your resistivity, uh, has a T square behavior, which indicates that there is a Fermi liquid uh, like behavior, which is stabilized below this 37 Kelvin. And this will be an important temperature in the uh, next few, in the next uh, couple of slides. Um, so this is uh, just a, uh, electronic. So this is just the measurement that I'm showing you uh, from the ARPUS uh, of what ytterbium trialuminide and also the lutetium trialuminide. 
So what you can readily see here is that uh, because the ARPUS is actually one electron removal process, if you started with an F14, you should get F13 uh, final state. But if you had started in a mixed state as an ethereum thalaminide, which you have a, both F14 and the F13 initial state, you would end up having an F13 and F12 final state. And as you can see here in ethereum thalaminide, we have clear contribution from both the F12 and the F13 final states, which is the green one. But as opposed to in lutetium thalaminide, which is a full F shell, you only have contribution from the F13 final state. So this again is a spectroscopic confirmation that ethereum thalaminide is a mixed valence system. Um, I will not go into this detail here. Here, we, we, I'm just showing that with the resonant inelastic extra scattering in our thin films, we can again confirm the change in ethereum valence by about 0 0.05 between room temperature and 40 Kelvin. But here, uh, so now let's look at the electronic structure in a little, close, uh, little closely. So where um, I'm just zooming in on in this region here, which is shown by the shaded blue region, and that is shown in here, and how it is changing as a function of temperature. So as you can see at a very high temperature, we have this electron pocket like here, and you have this incoherent F spectral weight. And as, you, as we go down in temperature, there are two things that are happening. One is that this electron pocket is gradually being pushed above the Fermi level. And by the time we are at 21 Kelvin, this whole of the electron pocket has moved above the Fermi level. And we can be a little more quantitative here. What we can do is that we can track the, in, the variation of the intensity along this, along binding energy zero or at the Fermi level as a function of temperature, which is plotted here. And as you can see the Fermi wave vector, which is basically the crossing of the electron pocket of this Fermi level, is actually changing as you go down in temperature. And by the time you are at 21 Kelvin, you have a single peak from the residual spectral weight because the whole of the electron pocket has moved up. And now if we were to calculate the Fermi wave vectors from uh, these fits, uh, this shows this sort of a temperature dependence. So what one can do is that we can uh, calculate the Luttinger volume uh, from uh, just assuming a, a spherical shape of this uh, electron pocket and to get um, uh, to get the effective, um, you know, per unit cell um, uh, charge. And so when we do that and we plot it on top of the change in the electron, uh, change in the local valence of the terbium, we see exactly one-to-one -one correspondence. So all these things are directly measuring the local ethereum valence, the change of it. And here we are, the red uh, circles are basically the change in the Luttinger volume that we estimated from our ARPUS measurement. So that uh, allows us to uh, make a, um, to, you know, uh, reveal what is happening in the system in the sense that at a high temperature, you have this uh, delocalized electrons and you have also a little poor screening of the ethereum local moment. But as you lo lower down in temperature, you have a Lipschitz transition in the sense that all of these elect uh, the electrons in this electron pocket is uh, emptied out and you have a much larger or a better screening of this uh, ethereum local moment, which is also changing the valence of the effective ethereum uh, of the ethereum, ethereum ions that one can measure in your uh, 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 in, uh, with RICS or any other measurements. Okay, but the important part for this talk uh, is that we want to, I, I want to draw your attention to, uh, to the change in the F states that we see in addition to the electron pocket in here. So as I said that uh, these, as you can see, these states here are much broader at high temperature and it's getting much sharper in the momentum space. And that can be readily quantified uh, by looking, uh, just by, you know, fitting the data here. So this data here, what I'm showing here is that I'm integrating uh, the variation. So I'm integrating, I'm integrating the variation in the intensity as a function of the binding energy along this direction over these areas where we are, can only pick up the spectral weight from the F electrons. And this is again another, because it's a momentum result technique, uh, this is another advantage of using ARPES. We can now pick and choose uh, and figure out the individual contributions uh, from multiple bands. And this is particularly useful in a multiband system like this. So the, uh, when we do that, as you can see that uh, as we go down 
um, in temperature from red to the blue, it's two things happening. This uh, the broad spectral wave has become sharper and it moves closer and closer to the Fermi level as we see here. And from here, we can actually get uh, an idea of the scattering rate, which is, um, so here I'm plotting of the uh, imaginary, uh, imaginary part of the self energy. So as you can see that that actually, which, which reflects the change in the scattering rate is actually going down and it's starting to saturate at around, around that 37 Kelvin where it shows the Fermi liquid behavior. And furthermore, if we look at the intensity, uh, or, uh, I mean, uh, the change in intensity as a function of temperature, it shows a very stark logarithmic rise and then which starts to saturate as you go down uh, further in temperature below this 37 Kelvin coherence temperature. Now, let me remind you the original question that we started out with. So we asked, can we enhance the F-electron density of states at the Fermi level? And hopefully I've convinced you that in this particular material system, taking advantage of the condo lattice effect, we can actually do that as you can clearly see in this RPS measurement. B, we asked, can we actually have a tunability of the F-electron density of states? And that is also, the answer is yes. As you can see, as a function of temperature, we can uh, induce a very large change in the effective F-electron density of states close to the Fermi level. And the next question is, of course, uh, can electron correlations be utilized? It looks like the electron correlations can be utilized to, uh, you know, realize these two particular uh, effects that we were looking for. So then the natural question is that, what is the effect of this on spin hall conductivity? And again, as I told you that because we are in a, on a thin film in a thin film geometry, we can readily uh, you know, uh, make heterostructures and we uh, took advantage of this capability uh, to create this heterostructure of iron and ytterbium trilaminite so that we can do um, spin talk ferromagnetic resonance measurement, which is probably uh, familiar to all of you. But anyways, ju I'll just quickly describe this. So what we're doing here is that in this heterostructure, we are passing a charge current through this ytterbium trilaminite layer, which in response is generating a spin current, as I discussed, in a, particular, in a perpendicular direction that is getting absorbed in the, by the ferromagnet, which is putting a torque on the magnetization vector. Now, because this is an RF current, okay, so this, uh, and this is done under an applied magnetic field, which, is, which then drives this magnetization vector into a resonant position, and then because of that, it also changes uh, because this effective magnetization vector is now uh, persisting. That also leads to a change in the anisotropic magneto resistance with the same frequency as that of the current. Now one can actually mix the current with this change in the, of the anisotropic uh, magneto resistance uh, uh, and read that as a DC voltage. And if you do some math, you will see that uh, you will get this sort of a functional from where you basically get uh, two parts, which is of which are of interest, which is a symmetric part, which gives an idea about the in-plane torque, and the anti-symmetric part, which gives you an idea about the out-of-plane torque, which is mainly gen due to the wasted field that is being generated by the application of this current. Now, by measuring this, uh, we can actually get an idea of the in-plane torque and the subsequent spin hall conductivity. And I'll explain a little bit in the subsequent slides. But just a few uh, things first about the structure. So as I said that the, we can grow a tubium trilaminide on the magnesium oxide, and we can also grow epitaxial iron on top of the magnesium oxide. If you particularly look at the crystal structure orientation that we expect iron to grow rotated 45 degree with respect to the tubium trilaminide and MGO, and that can be directly seen uh, from the read images in here, and also in X-ray diffraction. Uh, then second, uh, we can also characterize the magnet layer itself uh, by, uh, you know, with this ferromagnetic resonance technique, and we can uh, verify that the values that we are getting, for example, for the cubic and isotropic constant is not very different from that of a bulk, uh, bulk iron, uh, bulk uh, iron. And also the Gilbert damping parameter we get is about 0 0.003. And I think the literature value is between 0 0.002 and 0 0.004, which is also uh, gives us confidence that you know, the iron layer that we're growing is actually of high quality. And now uh, coming back to the spin hall effect. So as I was uh, telling you that we can, if, when we um, uh, get this, the mixing voltage as a function of the applied magnetic field, 
So we can get uh, this sort of a curve, which then uh, one can fit to us both of, uh, as a sum of a symmetric and an anti-symmetric component. And from the uh, symmetric component, one can get uh, an estimate of the spin hole conductivity. And we can do this exercise. And when we plot it uh, as a function of temperature, we can do this very different temperatures, right? And we do this for both ytterbium trilaminide and lutetium trilaminide. So remember, lutetium trilaminide was a conventional metal analog of ytterbium trilaminide, which had a full F shell where there is no expectation from condo effect. And ytterbium trilaminide was the one which had a 1F hole where we, we saw there is a very strong uh, condo lattice behavior. And we can see that in ytterbium trilaminide, very surprisingly, there is a very strong temperature dependence and which seems to be starting to saturate exactly below this uh, T star, which is about 37 Kelvin. Now, just to remind you that, uh, yes, uh, you know, unlike in lutetium trilaminide, where you don't have much difference in the spectral weight between 300 Kelvin and the 30 Kelvin, uh, as is also shown in here, and this slight difference can all be taken into account by the change in temperature because your Fermi distribution is changing. And so your integral spectral weight uh, doesn't show any change. Whereas in ytterbium trilaminide, as I discussed earlier, it is a very strong logarithmic temperature dependence, which starts to saturate at T star at this temperature. And now when we do this measurement at many different temperature and we just plot these two apparently disparate quantities of one is the integral spectral weight of the F electron density of states in ytterbium trilaminide and the spin hole conductivity that we measure in this heterostructure, we see a very strong uh, correspondence between these two quantities. One, uh, both in terms of the temperature dependence, that is both of them shows a logarithmic rise and also seems to be saturating below this T star. And, um, and just, so that you know, um, if uh, if you know if you are interested in terms of the numbers, so what is how much spin hole conductivity are we extracting? I have actually plotted with some of the more well-known uh, intermetallic systems um, that uh, has been measured or that people are enthusiastic about, and you can see that we have almost more than an order of magnitude um, higher spin hole conductivity that we have measured in these uh, material system, albeit at 37 Kelvin. But I wanted to also point out that even at room temperature, um, you know, we have a very strong, um, so, you know, this is almost um, like, or a point, almost 0. 0.5. So it is still uh, very close to the best that um, has been reported in the literature. I must uh, point out that these are all the ones that has been uh, extracted by uh, STFMR technique. There are, of, of course, recently two, um, not very recent, like a few years ago, um, two uh, um, reports of even higher spin hole conductivity, both using um, uh, second harmonic uh, technique. Uh, one is in bismuth antimony. Uh, which I believe is in room temperature and it's almost um, eight times uh, eight times higher. I think uh, not eight times. Um, I think it's almost closing to ten to the plus seven uh, range. And this is in a magnetic topological insulator, which is again at a very low temperature, uh, where also it has a higher spin hole conductivity than YBL three. But among all the known intermetallic systems which are measured by STFMR, we have more than an order of magnitude uh, larger um, value from, from YBL3. All right, so I think I'm almost uh, close to my allotted time. So I'll just leave with this final thought that I think uh, I have been able to convince you that we can enhance the spin hole conductivity from the hybridization of the 4F states with the itinerant bands. Uh, this seen the manipulation of you know this quantum many body states uh, we showed here in a condo lattice system, but perhaps in many other material systems can perhaps be a productive strategy for in increasing the spin hole efficiency. And one must remember that this uh, the strong correlation is not necessarily a low temperature physics. So there is hope that we can actually get this uh, very large effect even at room temperature, where it might start becoming more useful from the technology perspective. Um, and another uh, for the heavy fermion community, I think the spin orbit talks might be a way, uh, I mean, you know, to sensitively probe some of the characteristics of the heavy fermion systems in itself. And finally, just, uh, you know, which was a little aside, 
uh, in our ability to show this correspondence between the real space and the imaginary uh, and, the, and the momentum space uh, electronic structure in this material system. I hope to have convinced you that you know combination of synthesis and spectroscopy uh, really is powerful to offer new insights and perhaps new ideas for material design. Okay, with that, I want to thank uh, particularly uh, Neil Reynolds uh, for carrying out most of the STFMR measurements and uh, and some of the people that I have uh, in, really enjoyed working with, uh, Kyle Shen, Daryl Schlom, Dan Ralph, and uh, Chris Comstock. With that, uh, thank you, and I'm uh, happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sobik, for this wonderful overview of this uh, um, very interesting class of materials. So I clap for you for your excellent work. Um, so uh, do I have questions from others before I ask? Okay, uh, maybe I can just uh, kick start. This um, YP3, yes. so, uh, when you deposit, uh, mm -hmm. what you want, I mean, I'm a little bit more interested on the uh, yes, yes, digital so. details. Mm -hmm. You yes. use pottery? Mm -hmm. No, so yeah, I, I, maybe I didn't mention. Uh, so yeah, I use uh, MBE for uh, all. Um, so yes. MBE? M yeah, molecular beam epitaxy. Yes, uh, that okay. one that I, uh, I think you read, where is it? Um, I, have, I had a slide. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I used MBE. Okay. Can, and, can you uh, see my slides? Is it? Yes, I can still see. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll then see. Uh, so, um, Basically, the, uh, we have recently done some with iridium oxide, mm. also Dunder group has uh, done some work. So we also find um, there is another paper by a Japanese group that iridium oxide, or in general, this uh, yeah, iridium or ruthenium, and their uh, mm. oxides also you know, uh, are potential globally. Uh, so basically, 5D metal oxides. They're also good okay. for showing high spin and yeah. all that. So, um, but th those we actually deposited with sputtering. So do you think uh, using, using sputtering one can uh, deposit such thin films? Yes, yes, sure. I mean, uh, yeah, I think it is definitely possible. Um, so we were, uh, I, uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we actually, uh, we are right now fabricating some uh, Heusler alloys with, you know, these are also similar intermetallic systems. Um, so I think uh, definitely it's possible. Um, it's just that uh, one thing uh, for these uh, condo lattice systems, you know, uh, it has been found even in single crystals that they are very sensitive to impurities. Um, so the, the, the property that you get, uh, can vary quite a bit depending on the on the impurities uh, in your material system. Uh, but I, we did find that the ethereum triluminate was quite robust in terms of the, some of the some of the characteristics that we were ex we were interested in. So I think uh, it's definitely possible. Yes. Uh, whether it, will it be easy to get a single phase? Uh, that might be challenging. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I have some more questions, but I come back to that later. Uh, let's take from others. So there is Gabriel says, uh, uh, he thanks you. He thank you for your good talk. Uh, there is just a uh, talk from a uh, question from my student Obisek. Mm -hmm. So why did you choose to deposit iron on top of uh, YBL3? Uh, nickel iron could have also. Yeah, no, excellent, excellent question. Yes, uh, I take your point. I think nickel iron would have been even better. It's just that, you know, sometimes you are limited by the elements that are present in your chamber. Um, so honestly, that is the reason. And I would also say, that, and that's why I actually um, presented the magnetic characterization because, you know, one, you can get rid of magnetocrystalline and isotropy uh, quite a bit on nickel iron. Um, uh, but in iron, we could, did see very strong magnetocrystalline and isotropy. So we had to go to very high uh, frequencies. Um, but in nickel iron, you can uh, do a much better job, even lower frequency. Yeah, so nickel iron is uh, is much better. That is true. Um, and yeah, and I think uh, there won't be that much interfacial reaction as well. Um, so we, we we have plans to try it. Uh, we haven't done it yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I totally agree.
Hi, Sobi. Uh, so you are planning to kind of set up some HTML setup in TIFA? Uh, yes, uh, that's in the plans. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, not very immediately, but in the, hopefully in, within one, two years span. Yeah. Depending on. Uh, okay. I just have a very, uh, you know, maybe silly question for a spectroscopy person like you. So let's say whenever we are preparing something films. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we want to do, let's say, our pace to see mm -hmm. the actually the topological stage mm -hmm. and structure. But uh, the surface contamination is always a big risk. Yes. So uh, is it uh, um, like technology is there? That I give you a film, I deposit in my chamber, and you can still do the experiments uh, and the contamination somehow you can avoid. Yes. Without a yes. vacuum uh, suitcase. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, so I was just going to say, okay, in this case, uh, this measurements were done uh, in a setup where this uh, spectroscopy chamber was uh, connected via UHV in, uh, in the MBE. Um, but uh, I, maybe I just quickly showed some slides. So for both for this, this lutetium antimony work and for this, uh, this Heusler work, platinum gold lutetium antimony, both were um, so we did this at ALS, at the Advanced Light Source. So we could take uh, the, make the film in Santa Barbara, you put it in a vacuum suitcase, drive up there and uh, put it in that, uh, the chamber there um, and it worked. Um, and also we have, I, I am not showing that particular data, but we have exactly very of similar quality data where, um, so we can do some tricks, but that is dependent on what material. For example, in platinum lutetium antimony, um, so antimony, you know, is a volatile species, right? L relatively volatile species. So what we can do in the chamber, once you grow, you can lower down the temperature and you can grow an amorphous layer of antimony on top. So which prevents your sample from oxidation. And then you take it out, you know, just as you would take any other sample. Then you put it in a spectroscopy chamber and then you controllably heat your sample up to get rid of this antimony. And that is around 380 degrees Celsius. And you can recover the sample surface. The problem is sometimes you might have to be careful. I mean, in the sense that if this compound did not have any antimony, then it, there is a chance that the antimony will diffuse into your material system. And then, I mean, there are some materials challenges, you know, then one has to think whether uh, this antimony is basically reacting on the surface or not. So those kind of challenges are there. But if you have a volatile species, that's another way of doing things. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there are a few uh, nice questions from Sunil Nair. So he says, nice talk, a few queries. First one, T star is the condo coherence temperature. Correct. Is that true? Yes, yes. T star okay. is the condo coherence okay. temperature, yes. Okay, so next question is, why is the spin hall value so large? Hmm. I, 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 temperature itself. Right, right. And, and also I can see another question. I'll uh, answer both of them together that are there reports of spin hall measurement on elemental 4F like chromium and cerium, right? Yes. So yeah, this is a great question. And I think I might have glossed over it uh, quickly, but uh, so here is the thing. Yeah, uh, yes. So um, particularly if you look at this paper by actually Neil um, in this PRB 2017, so he actually measures uh, many different uh, uh, rare earth elements uh, for spin hall conductivity. And what he finds is that homium is, uh, gives him the, uh, the largest spin hall conductivity. But still, even if you take the largest among all the rare earth elements that he measured, I think he didn't measure cerium though. But I think you know, from, this, uh, uh, from this naive estimate, I think the cerium would be quite small compared to homium. Like you, you ideally would want like quarter or three quarter fill. Um, and that's what roughly also was a trend seen in the experiment. But anyway, so what I was going to show here is that, um, so yeah, homium is here. And ytterbium trilaminate is on the right. So you can see, I mean, it's orders of magnitude larger in YBL3. So this brings to the first question that is like, why is the spin hall value so large in the room temperature itself? So this, I, so this is an hypothesis. Um, well, I mean, maybe a little more educated guess in the sense that if you look at the band structure, let's go to the lutetium AL3 band structure. What is it? Huh. So even here, if you look, uh, so there is, um, 
compared to a elemental metal um you have still um a larger component not of f but of d um, orbitals and even in um, ybl3 even uh, at room temperature so there is still some incoherent spectral weight at 255 kelvin um so i think in general alloying with an elemental uh, like f f shell element uh, might uh, actually already be a good strategy to enhance the spin hall effect uh, and then of course the condo effect comes on top so that is would be my um, answer okay uh, so shivankar if you now can i just ask one more thing so shivankar very nice talk i really enjoyed it uh, thank you uh, uh, so so um uh, can you draw some inference regarding the, uh, the the heaviness of your electron itself with uh, yes. this i mean for instance uh, what would happen in, in that sense why bl3 is, is what you would think is 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 a, a below average heavy <laughs> yes. fermion system yeah, right yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, something like say sigma d3 or one of these uh, mm. big guys what do you think will happen there i mean i'm sure nobody has tried it but can you hazard a guess yes. so there is basically i, I would say uh, there's a positive and negative i i would say that yes i mean as you rightly said that you know if you have a very sharp change in your uh, uh, for example in cerium cobalt and cerium 5 or others where you have an even heavier mass so you see even more uh, flat right so you have a very high density of states very close to the fermi level so that might give you a higher um, you know i would expect you get an enhanced effect but on the other hand all these effects now push you down to lower and lower temperatures so i don't know if you can uh, convince the spin hall community like or the spintronics community uh, you know that these are really interesting or not uh, so that's uh, like a double edged sword in that sense but uh, but yeah i mean i think in, but basically in the still um, we don't have a very good theory in terms of where exactly pinpointing still uh, where exactly this is coming from Uh, in terms in is in, in a in a phenomenological model right um so that in itself might be very exciting and might be you know uh, might give us some more insights about how to design other materials for uh, large spin hall angles uh, and another uh, shubhankar is it okay if i ask one more please boss you are the boss okay uh, okay uh, so uh, so another uh, thing which i was just curious about I mean, because i was myself thinking about this something like now uh, so i i don't really remember it have been aluminum three uh, does it order antiferro magnetically no no it it does doesn't not. it, it does, does not right it does not okay and uh, and the ground state is fermi liquid is, is ground state is fermi liquid okay yes. and but in this high temperature region i mean what really amazes me is a spectacularly good values you've seen at room temperature itself i mean if in case this shubhankar's community has to be impressed it has to be this right. <laughs> yes 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 Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, so what is the resistivity like in that range? I mean, is it a good metal? Is it a? Uh, it's, it's definitely not a strange metal, right? No, no, no. No, this is actually it is. Um, yeah. So there is. So this is a resistivity from. Uh, mm. so you can see this. Uh, sorry about this YB. Uh, so, yeah. So there is this broad, you know, this spec thing, and that is uh, more uh, this, uh, you know, because it has a the effective condo temperature is quite high in this material. I think six seventy Kelvin estimated from this. Uh, how much you believe a periodic Anderson model? So within that framework, uh, it is six seventy Kelvin. So you get this broad, uh, you know, this range, and then here uh, you start to see this Fermi liquid. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would also mention that uh, you know our thin films are not. Uh, I mean, with single crystals you get RRR much better. Uh -huh. Now, how much that affects the spin hall conductivity? I don't know if we will know, but um, yeah. so one more thing we are interested in doing is um, so uh, looking at the if different uh, interfaces and see what is the uh, interfacial conductance uh, if you can, if you change that and how much is whether this is basically this is a lower bound right what we are measuring so if that if there is scope for improvement by uh, improving the uh, interface um, and another thing is that the we found that the very similar values for both Uh, about six nanometers and fifteen nanometer thin film. So I think so we can have an upper limit of the spin diffusion length is six nanometers, um, and we couldn't go down because uh, so okay there is another thing maybe I can just show. So if you go very close, then you start having dimensional effect, and uh, and uh, so you you actually can uh, kill the this hybridization. So this is not published yet, but anyway. So we. Oh, yeah. 
So we didn't go very low. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, so I do not see more questions. I will just ask uh, maybe one question if Sobhik doesn't mind. So I think that time I had some little bit of internet issue. I could not hear you, Sobhik, nicely. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I am a poor person. I don't have MBE. <laughs> you want to just spot it. So people like me, not poor people like me, if uh, they want to deposit such YBL3 or LUL3 or any other four F elements, is it possible by spotting or not at all possible? No, I think it is possible because I mean, okay, I don't have the reference, but so there is a paper on samarium hexaboride, which was grown by sputtering. Um, I think it was Ichiro or CL Shen. Um, anyway, so there is a science advances paper uh, on uh, spin hall conductivity of samarium hexaboride. But there, I mean, the problem was, I mean, so they were more looking into, uh, because maybe I can give a background. So samarium hexaboride is uh, proposed to be a topological condo insulator. So they were looking at whether those topological states that can uh, live within this condo induced gap can have a spin hall effect. And the whole thing was uh, the, the films were grown by um, sputtering. And I think the results were pretty good. So I, I think it is definitely doable. Shubankar, I would assume that, okay. uh, yeah. uh, you know, when you're doing this, but I mean, with these multi-component alloys, it's, it is probably difficult, but as long as you get repeatability, then, you know, you do can characterize your thin film specimens and get to know the physics is not going to change terribly, even if you have small changes in the, in the structure, in, in, in the composition. Yeah. Point, right. Yeah. And, and for heaven's sake, call, stop calling us. I would blood. believe you, but <laughs> yeah, I want to. Right. Yes. But Sunil, now we are completely out of money. So no new As I told you sometime back on Facebook, if you are poor, I am Tom Cruise. <laughs> Sorry? If you are poor, I am Tom Cruise. <laughs> eh, yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, Sunil, very nice to have you. So, excellent uh, discussions we have. So I do not see any more questions from any other uh, participants. So thank you so much, Sobik, for this uh, really nice overview. And I wish you all the best for your bright uh, career ahead and your venture at PIFR. Hopefully, we'll meet soon in person once this pandemic is over. Yes, yes. Actually yes, planning yes. to organize okay, some yeah. small conference. I may, I may bother you, Sunil, and other friends uh, to come over to NICER. And, uh, of course, of course. It will be a great pleasure. Okay, so thank you so much. So I end uh, many class for your excellent lecture and uh, very nice interaction. Thank you. Stay safe. Next week, we will have talk by Professor Venkat Kamlakar from uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. So uh, also, I think three o'clock uh, next week, Thursday. See you then. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Sobik. Bye. -bye. Bye.